So we're just going to let a few more people hop on, but uh, just to kind of cover what we said in the group, um, you know, we, we've been doing this master class now for almost a year or so, at least going on it. And I think that uh, through conversations with um, the Cardiovascular Education Foundation and some of the physician staff, and obviously, um, you know, Dr. Adafe has been integral in this. Um, what we've tried to do is restructure it to have a more, you know, thought out plan of what we're going to cover and have lessons kind of build on themselves. Uh, so you might see in these early conversations, a lot of review. You probably know a lot of this. And if you don't, um, we're happy to... Uh, to help, you know, shed any light you may have. And then we'll continue to build to obviously more complex lessons over time. So if this seems a little simple for you to begin with, it's it's not going to stay that way. Um, and if this is challenging now, just let us know, raise your hand so we can, we can help you along the way. Uh, well, physicians can help you along the way and uh, we'll get everyone up to speed. So I think it's seven after we can probably get started here if that works. So we have Dr. Liam Vitezik from Mass General Harvard. Um, he is an assistant professor of medicine and does a lot of teaching um, uh, both in Boston and overseas as well, working with uh, the Rwandan cardiology groups uh, to help with their uh, their education. So if you, uh, I don't know how you want to do it, Leon, as far as people raising their hands. I can just monitor the chat for any pertinent questions if that works and just uh, let us know how we can. I think that's uh... a great idea, just in case I miss a comment. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So just please reach out in the chat if you do have any questions as we go. And then if you want to take it off, I appreciate it. Sure, I'm happy to I'm happy to begin. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. It's great to join all of you. And I was asked to provide a basic description of the heart's electrical conduction system, as well as some of its physiologic properties. As AJ has already mentioned, uh, many of you may find a lot of what's included in today's session a review. And of course, my goal here is for this to be not so much didactic as much as it is conversational. So if you find that I uh, cover a point that's interesting to you, please don't hesitate to ask a question or speak up and we can take this conversation in the direction that you all choose. So my goal here is to not go longer than an hour, even including conversations. Uh, I feel like, uh, especially as we're covering the more basic topics, um, longer lecture times are not necessarily associated with uh, greater benefit to you. So I wanna be mindful of your time and try to keep this uh, succinct into the call, into the point. So uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about cardiac conduction system in health and to some extent in, in disease. I have three basic objectives for today's session. First is uh, the following. At the end of today's session, my hope is that you'll be able to describe the anatomy and the physiology of the cardiac conduction system. The second objective is that at the end, I hope that you'll be able to recognize common manifestations of disease in the heart's electrical conduction system. And last, uh, I hope that you'll be able to describe the actions of common medications uh, on the cardiac conduction system. Of course, several of these objectives relate to uh, full lectures, which we'll have later on in this series, but today's uh, lecture is effectively an introduction at least to some of these things. So let's take it away and, and jump into objective number one, which is the basic anatomy and physiology of the heart's electrical conduction system. So on the left of this slide is a skeletonized view of the heart in which you see the heart's electrical conduction system as well as the coronary arterial tree. This is a slide that uh, was forwarded to me by, by, by my colleague, Dr. Warren Harthorn. And in it, you see several notable structures. First is the sinoatrial node, which is a subepicardial structure uh, sitting adjacent to the sinus venosus, uh, kind of at the right upper hand corner of the atrium. And you also see the atrioventricular node, which under typical circumstances is the only electrical connection between the upper and lower chambers of the heart, distal to which is the bundle of His, followed by the right bundle, which is a cord-like structure, which travels down uh, the uh, right ventricular side of the interventricular septum, and then uh, connects with the free wall of the ventricle. In many cases, uh, it's thought that this connection is made through the moderator band, 
uh, a structure often visible within the RV apex. And then you have the left bundle, uh, which has both anterior and posterior fascicles. And as you can see, the left bundle is a much broader fan-like structure, uh, which covers the better part of the interventricular septum uh, more on the left side of the septum. I've included an ECG of uh, the surface uh, just to represent some of the basic electrical events that occur. As you all well know, uh, the sinoatrial node uh, depolarizes spontaneously, leading to um, contraction of the atria. This contraction is nearly simultaneous in part because of rapid transit si of signals from the left, from the right to the left uh, through various structures, including the Bachman bundle. Although the left atrium inevitably contracts just a little bit after the right. And this depolarization of the atria is what we see as the P wave on the surface of the ECG. These signals then coalesce on the AV node, which as I mentioned earlier is under typical circumstances, the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricle. Here, the signals pause for a moment, which is the reason why we have an isoelectric interval between the P wave representative of the depolarization of the atria and the QRS complex, which represents depolarization of the ventricles. Now, uh, once the AV node fires, these signals traverse the bundle of his and the bundle branches leading to nearly simultaneous um, contraction of different segments of the ventricles, although there is a sequence, meaning the interventricular septum fires first with propagation of uh, the wavefront towards the apex and then around towards the lateral walls, eventually ending up in the um, basolateral areas of the ventricles adjacent to the atrioventricular valves. So this broader wavefront down in the middle and out to the sides uh, proceeds very rapidly and is what we see as the QRS complex. And then there's an electrical recovery of the ventricles, uh, which includes under typical circumstances, an isoelectric interval after the QRS complex, which is the ST segment, followed by a repolarization signal, uh, which is what we see as the T wave. You should know that uh, the electrical recovery of the atria is not something that we, we typically visualize. And that's for two reasons. First is that the, uh, the current of uh, depolarization, repolarization is much smaller for the atria than it is for the ventricles in large part because of a much smaller amount of muscle mass. So there's just less signal there. So uh, the repolarization signal associated with the atria is gonna be very small. And the second reason why we don't typically see it is it's under ordinary circumstances buried under the QRS complex. So just a brief primer here regarding the basic structures of the cardiac conduction system, as well as uh, how these different components of the system are active during different parts of the cardiac cycle. I've included this uh, chest X-ray to give you a very brief primer regarding the location of these various structures in uh, the context of a study that we very often review, notably a chest X-ray. So this is a, an AP view of a person with a dual chamber pacemaker in place. And here you see the heart borders uh, with both leads of the pacemaker clearly visible as well as the pulse generator. It's noteworthy that the right atrial lead uh, is typically placed in the appendage of the right atrium. And that's an anterior structure such that um, that curve that you see in the atrial lead is really projecting toward us out of the plane of the X-ray. And then you've got the right ventricular lead, which is sitting in this case in the apex of the right ventricle, which is not at the left border of the heart in an AP view. I think it's important to note that the lower left border of the heart is actually the lateral border of the left ventricle, and that the right ventricle is something you could consider to be uh, a roughly equilateral triangle sitting on the diaphragm, such that the apex of the right ventricle is not nearly all the way out towards uh, the lateral border. And in this uh, schematic 
that I've overlaid on top of the chest X-ray, I've also included locations of the right and left atria as well as right and left ventricles and the location of the sinoatrial node, which sits again at the junction of the sinus venosus here in the lateral wall of the right atrium, as well as the location of the AV node, which sits at the crux of the heart in a fibrous region just between uh, the, the atria, just proximal to the tricuspid valve. It's on the right side under typical circumstances, um, even though it sits at the crux of the heart. Although in some cases, fibers associated with the sinoatrial node um, can be very close to the left side as well. So just a very brief primer of where everything sits in space uh, with respect to the type of study you're gonna be reviewing uh, every, very commonly, if not every day, notably a chest X-ray. So just a few words about the uh, anatomic structure of pacemaker cells. And we'll start with uh, some pictures of the sinoatrial node. Now, this is a, a morphometric analysis that was recently published of the sinoatrial node. So what we're doing here is we're, we're looking in a right anterior oblique view of the right atrium where we see the superior vena cave at the top, inferior vena cave at the bottom, sinus venosus here, appendage of the right atrium here, and the ventricles a little bit out of the view. And in this case, uh, this is a, a, a grayscale image in which the, uh, the histologically determined location of the sinoatrial node is, is highlighted in this greenish hue here. And you see that the sinoatrial node is like a comma-like structure, which can be up to two centimeters uh, in length. And as I mentioned, it's subepicardial and surrounds the, sin, the sinus node artery. And here's a, a cross-sectional view um, of the wall of the atrium in which you see uh, the distinct staining pattern associated with the sinus node as well as its location adjacent to the sinus node artery. And the sinus node tissues are very distinct from the surrounding myocardium, and this can be defined with histopathology as well. And it's been shown uh, in multiple studies over the years that if you were to take a histopathologic view of the sinus uh, node, that you see that it's much more fibrous and fatty tissue as compared with surrounding tissues. So it's visually very distinct. Um, and it's also noteworthy that this is the location of the spontaneously firing pacemaker cells uh, leading to the, uh, the electrical wave fronts, which then propagate to the surrounding myocardial tissues, which will conduct these electrical signals, but will not uh, create them spontaneously. Now, another uh, important set of spontaneously firing uh, pacemaker cells resides in the atrioventricular node. And this is, as I mentioned, something that sits at the crux of the heart, just on the atrial side um, uh, and uh, on the right side of the interatrial septum, distal atri interatrial septum, very close to the tricuspid valve. Now, this is another uh, histopathologic view of the atrioventricular node, which itself sits very close to a supplying artery. In this case, it sits directly adjacent to the AV nodal artery. And you can see in this view that, as is the case for the SA node, the AV node is histologically distinct from the surrounding myocardial tissue and from the surrounding um, uh, fibroelastic skeleton of the heart. And you can see in this view, uh, the compact atrioventricular node, as well as um, the beginnings of the bundle of Hiss and the distal conduction system. And as I mentioned, uh, these histopathologic distinctions from the surrounding tissue uh, are also a reflection of their functional and physiologic differences as compared with surrounding myocardial tissue. And in this last slide of the heart's electrical conduction system, I'm showing you the more comprehensive morphometric analysis in multiple views of both the sinoatrial node as well as the compact AV node and segments of the bundle branches.
which are seen here. And now, now I wanted to just jump forward to uh, the physiologic distinctions between spontaneously firing pacemaker cells and uh, surrounding myocardial tissue. As I mentioned already, uh, the main distinction here is that these pacemaker cells, which reside in the AV node, the SA node, and to some extent in the more distal Hisperkinchy system, these are distinguished from other um, conducting tissues in the heart by virtue of the fact that they fire spontaneously. And the question is, why does that happen? Well, I've, to answer that question, I've included a picture of a pacemaker action potential. And these are this is the sort of action potential that you would expect to see in the SA node and the AV node, and to some extent in the Hisperkinji system, or at least in segments thereof. And the distinguishing feature of the pacemaker action potential is the fact that it's constitutively leaky. Uh, and so calcium is always traversing across it, as is to a certain extent uh, potassium. And this leads to spontaneous depolarization. Um, and what happens is with this calcium leak, what happens is there's a certain point at which uh, a, a threshold voltage is achieved. And then you have long type calcium channel currents that lead to a more sharp spike in depolarization, which is what is uh, physiologically manifest as the firing of the SA node followed by repolarization and due to this constitutive leakiness, the voltage creeps from baseline again. So again, it's this permeability and relatively slow kinetics of these channels that lead to that spontaneous firing activities that we see as being either sinus beats or junctional beats. Now, these... Uh, this leakiness of um, the ion currents is something that is influenced uh, by autonomic nerve fibers that contact the SA node and AV node very extensively. Uh, what happens is with sympathetic tone uh, or increased catecholaminergic tone, you have firing through beta-1 receptors, which increases cyclic AMP levels, and it stimulates that inward L-type calcium current, making um, this leakiness increase, and it also increases the velocity of um, the firing of the SA node. And with parasympathetic, increased parasympathetic tone, what you have is acetylcholine uh, present locally at higher levels, leading to firing through MT receptors and inhibitory G protein activation and activation of that IK current and hyperpolarization. And this leads to a change in the slope of that leakiness, making it less leaky, right? Such that the timing. Uh, so that it takes longer for that voltage to creep up to that critical threshold so that the calcium channels will fire. And it also decreases the rate at which the firing happens. So you see, it's not just the leakiness, it's the, it's the shape of the firing that changes. And so this is the sort of underlying physiologic mechanism that's responsible for the heart beating faster in the midst of a fight or flight response or the heart beating slower in the context of what we will commonly call a vagal response. Now, the spontaneously firing pacemaker cells have a very different action uh, potential to uh, a myocardial cell, which is what I'm showing you in this slide. So here, uh, you do not have any spontaneous leakiness of ion channels at baseline such that you have a very flat baseline uh, voltage at minus 96. And the event, the, um, the depolarization event does not occur spontaneously, but rather happens in response to extrinsic stimuli, as I mentioned, from surrounding uh, cells, uh, either myocardial cells or for those myocardial cells that's directly adjacent to a pacemaker cell, 
from the pacemaker cells itself. The first component of depolarization is inward sodium currents leading to this dramatic depolarization across the membrane, which then levels out as a function of potassium and calcium currents. And then potassium currents are largely responsible for electrical recovery or repolarization uh, back towards the uh, baseline state or the baseline voltage of the cell. And as I mentioned earlier, this myocardial action potential is what you're going to see everywhere but the SA node, the AV node, and select regions within the Hisperkinji system that can fire spontaneously. So now that we've had a brief view into the basic anatomic structures in the cardiac conduction system and their physiologic properties, I was hoping we can move on to our second objective, which is to uh, help you all recognize the common manifestations of disease in the heart's electrical conduction system. So something that we need to be very aware of is the possibility that these components of the heart's electrical conduction system, uh, notably the SA node, AV node, as well as the Hisperkinji system, can present with slowed or even blocked conduction. And this slowing or blocking of conduction through these structures can happen uh, as a result of a number of different phenomena, including a series of irreversible causes as well as reversible causes. And I thought we could spend just a few moments reviewing some of these now. So perhaps the most common cause for slowing or, or blocked conduction through the heart's electrical conduction system is idiopathic or age-related fibrosis. And it's been shown that as we age, there is progressive deposition of uh, fibroblasts throughout the heart structure. Now, we're all uh, aware of myocardial infarctions that can lead to focal areas of scarring, right? But it's also important to note that fibrosis that is more diffuse can happen as a function of age, even in the absence of any uh, ischemic events or infarctions. But it's also important to note that areas of ischemia or infarction can affect the heart's conduction system. And one of the reasons why I included this skeletonized view of the heart in which you see the coronary arterial tree as well as uh, the heart's electrical conduction system is that I wanted to show you just how intimately connected the two are. And you could easily see how blockage in the LAD, for example, can have a big impact on the viability of tissues in the left bundle, for example, or in the right bundle for that matter. Uh, although generally speaking, the LAD uh, is more responsible for uh, supplying the left bundle with blood and the right coronary artery and its tributaries are more responsible for supplying uh, the, the uh, right bundle branch block or right bundle, bundle branch with blood. It's notable that the AV node uh, receives a dual blood supply in most people such that uh, if you were to uh, block both of those, uh, you'd be in a very dire situation indeed. Um, and so uh, to, to a certain extent, there are even some in the literature who have said that the AV node is uninfarctable um, because it's impossible to infarct the AV node without leading to total shutdown of the system. Uh, infiltrated diseases um, can also impact the heart. These include things like amyloidosis and sarcoidosis, things which are statistically much less common than just age-related fibrosis or ischemia, but are still out there and still uh, worth thinking about. It's also important to, to remember that structural heart disease, both inborn and acquired, meaning congenital heart disease and things like rheumatic heart disease, all these things can lead to uh, significant um, slowing or blockage of conduction through the electrical conduction system. And surgery is another possible cause. If you go in there and say you have a rheumatic uh, mitral valve and you have to cut out that valve, um, all of you are well aware that when that valve comes out, it's uh, very frequently encased in a lot of scar tissue or sometimes even calcified scar tissue such that a lot of tissue has to leave uh, with the diseased valve before a new valve can be put in. So just 
the the surgical procedure by which a necessary valve proceed uh, valve replacement is performed can lead to a lot of extensive damage to the heart's electrical conduction system. There are a few reversible causes um, for conduction system disease. Uh, these are most commonly medications, things that can lead to slowing uh, of conduction through um, the heart or even heart block. There are some uh, metabolic issues as well, uh, like uh, most notably potassium level issues, right? You know, people who are hypokalemic or hyperkalemic can have uh, changes in the properties of their conduction system leading to bradycardia or heart block. And perhaps the least frequent is uh, inflammation, uh, things like uh, systemic conduction, uh, connective tissue diseases, or even Lyme disease as an infectious disease that can lead to uh, transient heart block. I think most of the time we're dealing with irreversible causes though. And this is just a, a, an old slide showing um, the results of the percent of fibrosis in the sinoatrial node measured in uh, post-mortem uh, cardiac evaluations performed in infants, children, adolescents, and adults, and the elderly showing that there's this steady increase in fibrosis uh, in the sinoatrial node, which again is not something that's typically affected by a myocardial infarction, uh, indicating just how uh, progressive, uh, seemingly in a linear fashion, um, this deposition of fibrosis can be. Now, the location of the uh, heart block is very important, uh, meaning the following. Now, you can have block anywhere in the heart's electrical conduction. You can have a disease within the sinoatrial node leading to sick sinus syndrome. You could have block within the compact AV node, um, which can lead to either a first degree AV block or a second degree AV block. Although when we're talking about the compact AV node, the type of uh, second degree AV block we're expecting to see is a Wenckebach type block or Mobitz type one. As distinct from Mobitz type two block, which is something that is associated with block below the level of the compact AV node, meaning within the His uh, Purkinje system. This alongside complete heart block are considered to be much more ominous because these spontaneously firing pacemaker cells in the His Purkinje system are much less reliable and can lead to asystole in those people in whom there's uh, blockage within the distal conduction system below the level of the compact AV node. So very briefly, if you have disease in the cardiac conduction system um, at the level of the compact AV node or above, this is generally less ominous. And in the guidelines, you'll see that indications for pacemaker implantation for people with sinoatrial node disease or Wenckebach type block uh, are really based on burden of symptoms and how slow the heart rates get. Whereas if a person has heart block that is associated with um, disease distal to the compact AV node, um, that's a situation where the person would qualify for pacemaker implantation, even in the absence of symptoms or sustained periods of bradycardia based on the unreliable nature of pacemaker cells uh, distal to the compact AV node. Dr. Tazik, just a question there then. Yeah. So um, for Mobitz, on that previous slide, yeah, Mobitz type 1, Winky Bach, does that, mm -hmm. so do you see progression to a second degree Mobitz 2 then, or are those- Not necessarily, no. Associated? It, it often happens in very distinct circumstances. Um, and again, this will be the topic of a different lecture but I think it's very important to be able to distinguish between the two on an EKG and also be aware of the fact that when you see somebody with second degree AV nodal block, it's often the case that they'll have other evidence of distal conduction system disease like IBCD or right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block, not always, but often. So I think understanding the company it keeps uh, is an important thing here and know that 
these two things are not necessarily the same thing, meaning, you know, uh, Wenke Bach versus Mobitz type two, not necessarily a progression in all cases. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. And that's in part based on what you might expect, meaning you can have generalized fibrosis leading to some disease in the compact AV node, which again has a dual AV, uh, dual uh, blood supply, but say that person has an MI, right? With a subsequent left bundle uh, leading to less reliable conduction through distal fibers. So you can see how somebody who could have a second degree AV block for a long time and it can be benign, suddenly end up with Mobitz type two block because of a very physiologically distinct phenomenon, meaning instead of just generalized progressive fibrosis, you have an MI event or progression of valve disease, you know, with calcification, either the mitral annulus or even um, the annulus of the aortic valve, right? Impinging on these structures at the crux of the heart. I hope that answers the question. More than, thank you very much. Appreciate okay. Um, so it's also important to note that fibrosis uh, can be a substrate for arrhythmias that come from locations outside of the heart's electrical conduction system. And one very notable example of this is ventricular tachycardia. And so what I've provided here is a figure that was adapted uh, from a colleague of mine, Andre Davila, a figure that he gave me a number of years ago. And here we're looking at stained slices of myocardium uh, in the short axis, meaning you're looking at the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And sequential slices have been taken through uh, a scarred and uh, diseased heart. And you can stack these slices uh, in this staircase going from base to apex, for example, to get an understanding of where the scar is located within the heart. And here the staining, um, even though it's just black and white here, it's important to note that the, with the staining, the way it's performed here, viable myocardium stains black, whereas scar tissue is white here. And the one thing that I, that I would like to uh, draw your attention to here is the fact that even though this is a person who's undergone a very extensive myocardial infarction, it's not the case that you've got this homogeneous uh, area of scar. Rather, you've got interdigitation of scar tissue as well as viable tissue. And what that leads to is the following. You have conduction of electrical signals through this myocardium. Again, these are not pacemaker cells. This is the non-spontaneously firing myocardium with that square wave uh, action potential that we reviewed earlier. And so these are cells that are only going to fire in response to stimuli from their neighbors. And what you see is through this interdigitation of diseased and viable tissue, you can have areas of tissue through which these signals propagate more slowly as distinct from the normal fast rate of propagation of viable tissue. And this leads to what's called anisotropy, meaning you've got two adjoining tissue areas that conduct at very different tissue velocities. And what can happen is that you can end up with a reentrant cycle um, because what happens is uh, as the myocytes are uh, electrically recovering or repolarizing, repolarizing, what happens is the following. Immediately after depolarization, uh, the tissue is completely refractory, meaning any additional extra stimulus will not need to will not lead to uh, depolarization. Whereas later stimuli will find the tissue in a, a relatively refractory state, meaning uh, the tissue will conduct, but only in a delayed fashion, for example. And so what can happen is uh, you can have propagation of a signal that goes from the base to the apex in an ordinary fashion, but say that signal finds an area of scar in which that signal propagates very slowly and perhaps even propagates backward on itself, right? Backward uh, with respect to the original 
direction of depolarization and find some tissues that are only relatively refractory and can once again depolarize, leading to formation of these little self-sustaining electrical circuits that are outside of the electrical conduction system. So instead of having this prevailed signaling from the sinoatrial node to the AV node to the Hisperkinji system in this sort of linear fashion, once per cardiac cycle, you can create this circuit that perpetuates itself that is independent of any other signals um, within the ventricular myocardium. And this is what is observed as ventricular tachycardia. So I'm, I'm showing you this slide just to summarize, to show that disease in the myocardium and the ventricles leads to not just a plumbing problem, meaning not just pump failure, but also uh, increases your likelihood of having a ventricular arrhythmia because you've got this interdigitation of diseased and healthy tissue leading to anisotropy and uh, more opportunities for creation of these uh, reentrant circuits. And the problem with these reentrant circuits is that uh, because the distance traveled over them is much shorter than the total distance traveled by the, an ordinary heartbeat, it can fire much faster. So that's one of the reasons why it's tachycardia. It's fast because it's, it's the, you know, the time that it takes to go around one of these circuits, as I'm showing you in the left lower hand part of this slide, is much faster than the firing rate of the sinoatrial node. So this will take over your heart rhythm. And in the context of ventricular tachycardia, you should also note that depending upon where that signal or where that uh, reentrant circuit is sitting, and depending on how diseased the rest of the myocardium may be, that rapid rhythm may also lead to very disorganized contraction of the ventricle such that it does not produce a pulse. So even though the ventricle is depolarizing, it's not squeezing as efficiently as it needs to. Like I said earlier, under ordinary circumstances, what you have is top-down conduction through the interventricular septum out to the apex and out to the lateral walls landing in the lateral ventricles close to uh, the AV nodal groove. And this leads to this very distinctive squeezing of the ventricles, which is its most efficient state. Whereas if you have extra beats coming from the apex, and if these extra beats are happening, not just very fast, but propagating in a backwards orientation and also propagating through diseased tissue, you can have a situation where even though electrically, the ventricles fire, it leads to uh, little to no squeeze, such that the heartbeats produced by this type of electrical event do not produce a pulse, which is why it's so dangerous to have ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, because it has an immediate impact on your blood pressure. Now, this type of reentrant circuit is something you can see in other types of arrhythmias in the heart as well. And I've shown you some examples here of supraventricular arrhythmias, um, including AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is uh, the result of slow and fast conducting fibers within the area of the AV node, which can be self perpetuating. There's Wolf Parkinson White syndrome or um, uh, what you have when you have an accessory pathway or an additional electrical connection between the upper and lower chambers of the heart, which can produce a circuit, including the atria, the AV node, the Hisperkinji system, ventricular myocardium, as well as the accessory pathway. So this is a macro reentrant circuit that you find in Wolf Parkinson White. And then you have atrial tachycardia, which can be a micro reentrant um, circuit, or it's also possible that this can be a spontaneously uh, firing nest of cells as well that are that is not reentrant. But I include this primarily to raise the point that this concept of uh, arrhythmias arising from circuits created by adjoining areas of tissue that either conduct quickly or slowly, uh, this underlies many different supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, and this is just an example of a mechanism for re-entry in, uh, in AV node re-entrant tachycardia, in which you have propagation of signals from the atrium, both through slow and fast conducting fibers within the AV node, 
And under ordinary circumstances with a regular sign of speed, only the fast conducting fibers go through to the ventricle and the slow conducting fibers, you know, by the time they reach the distal part of the AV node, they find tissue that is completely refractory so that signal stops there. Whereas if you have a PAC, a premature atrial contraction, and if that PAC happens early enough so that um, you, uh, the, uh, the fast conducting fibers in the AV node are not yet uh, open for business, so to speak, right? They're still refractory, then the signals will conduct antegrade via the slow pathway leading to a long PR interval. And under some circumstances, you can be in a situation where um, you have a PAC that, that conducts antegrade via slow conducting fibers. And it may be that when it reaches this distal part of the AV node, it conducts downward to the ventricles, but it finds these tissues in the fast pathway or the fast conducting fibers of the AV node that they are no longer refractory. So say the PAC happened just late enough, right? So that these fast conducting pathways are no longer refractory. Then you can have retrograde conduction via the fast fibers. And if you have a second uh, event such that you, you find that not only are the distal fibers of the fast pathway uh, non-refractory when the signal makes it, but also the proximal fibers of the slow pathway not refractory when this retrograde signal makes it through, you can have the self-perpetuating circuit leading to what is observed as AVNRT. Now, this is just one example in addition to ventricular tachycardia and other arrhythmias that you can find uh, in other regions of the heart. What I failed to mention here is that uh, this is a slide that was taken from um, educational materials uh, at Dundee, and I can provide uh, a reference for this in separate cover. So we've talked about the basic anatomy and physiology of the cardiac conduction system. We've talked about common manifestations of disease in the cardiac conduction system, including reversible and irreversible causes for slowing or blocked conduction through the conduction system. What I wanted to do is uh, take just a few minutes now to describe in very basic terms the actions of some common cardiac medications in the heart's electrical conduction system using these um, uh, diagrams of, uh, of uh, depolarization waveforms as an example. So as, as I'm sure you're all aware, there are several classes of cardiac medications. Uh, historically, these were uh, referred to as the Vaughn Williams classes for different cardiac medications, including class one medications, which function primarily as sodium channel blockers, things like propafenone and flecainide. Uh, class two agents, which are beta blockers. Class three agents, which are um, potassium, potassium channel blockers like sodalol or defetilide. Or class four agents, which are calcium channel blockers. And it's noteworthy that amiodarone, something that inevitably uh, you have all used in the past, um, even though it is generally classified as a class three agent, it has properties of all four classes. So what's happening when you give these medications? Well, let's start with class two and, and class four. Class two and class four agents um, are gonna be characterized most by their action on the spontaneously firing pacemaker cells. So what happens with beta blockers is that uh, you block the impact of beta adrenergic uh, neuron firing on uh, at the SA node and the AV node. And what happens there is that you'll have uh, decreased leakiness, right? Uh, of those um, calcium and potassium currents and it'll slow the rate of firing of the, of the calcium current. So it'll, it'll cause the heart to beat less frequently. There's an additional um, uh, non-conduction component to its function, which is that it also cause um, the myocardium to beat less strongly. But just thinking about the cardiac conduction system, we're thinking about how, why it is that 
these beta blockers will lead to a lower rate of firing. It's because it's blocking that catecholaminergic uh, increase in leakiness uh, of these currents. If you give a calcium channel blocker, well, that acts more directly on these uh, calcium currents that are responsible for the spontaneous firing of pacemaker cells, both in the SA node and the AV node. So it can have a very similar effect to beta blockers, even though the calcium channel blockers will not impact ad, um, adrenergic signaling the way beta blockers will. Now, class one agents uh, will block sodium channels and so that'll affect the depolarization in uh, myocytes or cells that are not spontaneously firing. And this can be helpful for treatment of ventricular tachycardias and in some cases of atrial fibrillation as well. And last, you have, cal you have class three agents, which are potassium channel blockers, which will change the repolarization of the heart and uh, extend the time in which each myocyte is refractory to um, outside electrical impulses. So it decreases the likelihood that a myocyte will act on or propagate a signal that it received from a neighboring cell. And it's also important to remember that calcium channel blockers will have an impact on non-pacemaker cells as well, because calcium channels are also involved in repolarization. And so these can serve to uh, inhibit the extent to which um, cardiac myocytes propagate signals they receive from their neighbors. So I appreciate it's a lot in one slide, but what I was hoping to do is just dissect out the reasons for the differing effects of these different medications with respect to the different um, waveforms you're going to see for depolarization in spontaneously firing pacemaker cells seen shown in this right upper hand panel versus non-spontaneously firing uh, cardiac myocytes in this right lower hand panel. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about evabradine, which um, functions to uh, in influence the the eye funny current or the, uh, the leaky potassium channel that's responsible in part for this spontaneous depolarization of sinoatrial node and AV node tissues. And what evabradine will do is it'll reduce that slow diastolic depolarization and can reduce the heart rate and has been thought of as being another treatment for people who have uh, various conditions, uh, notably um, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And I mentioned this outside of the world of the Vaughn Williams classes because this is a more recently um, described medication. And so that's the end of uh, my prepared comments. It's It's been great to join all of you today and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. I I know that I I definitely learned a lot along the way. Uh, when you're talking about medication, obviously you'd mentioned, um, you know, the effects on contractility of the heart. Could you drill down a little bit more into how that can affect what medication you decide to put a patient on, as well? Sure. the The most obvious uh, thing to think about is the following: if you have somebody who presents in decompensated heart failure, meaning somebody in whom the heart is struggling to contract forcefully enough to keep up with demand. Um, this is not the sort of person in whom a negative inotrope like a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker would be a good idea because what can happen is if you have somebody in severely decompensated heart failure and you add on a beta blocker, it it takes that struggling muscle and makes it impossible for it to keep up. And so you can actually uh, precipitate untoward events. That's, that's probably the biggest example. So you can produce heart failure. You can actually increase mortality by doing that. Interesting. Thank you for, uh, for clarifying on that. So um, as Dr. Oladabeji can attest, um, you know, it, we do have, a, uh, a solution for some of this uh, Wolf, Parkinson, White, and other 
um, you know, arrhythmias through ablation now, but it's obviously in its, its infancy um, in Nigeria. But questions as far as patients who, you know, aren't ready to be addressed through ablation. So you have Wolf, Parkinson, White, or other forms of reentry where you have tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Is there a certain medication you would recommend for these younger patients to help address it as a bridge to, to ablation or other therapies? It's going to be completely context specific. Um, so there's no blanket statement to be made, but I would say that if you have somebody in whom you're worried about the presence of an accessory pathway, and if you see wide complex tachycardia in that person, you need to be very cautious about considering giving an AV nodal blocker, because what can happen is the following, hold on a second, bring it back to this diagram. So if you have a, uh, a wide QRS complex that, that could be consistent with anti-grade conduction via the accessory pathway, okay? As distinct from tachycardia with somebody with an accessory pathway with a narrow complex, which is more consistent with anti-grade conduction via the AV node. And, and the reason why I'm making that distinction is the following. If you've, the accessory pathway is going to have sodium channels like the surrounding myocardium, okay? Whereas uh, the, the AV node is gonna have calcium channels, right? And also it's gonna have very uh, specific physiology that'll reduce the firing rate uh, or reduce conduction with increased firing rate, um, such that if you were to give an AV nodal blocker, uh, you can reduce the extent to which the AV node contributes to conduction, and you can have unopposed conduction via the accessory pathway, which can be fatal. Especially if you have somebody, say somebody has atrial fibrillation, and mm -hmm. it's conducting via both the accessory pathway and the AV node, but the, but the brakes that the AV node puts on is, is keeping things stable. If you remove the AV node component, and you just go down the accessory pathway, then you know you have a heart rate of 300 in the context of AFib that gets directly transmitted at a one-to-one -one rate to the ventricles. So you're you know you're leading to a, a that's you know a comparable heart rate to ventricular fibrillation. So that can be very dangerous. So if you've got uh, wide complex tachycardia, uh, you need to be very cautious about considering. Uh, giving any AV nodal blocker, whether it's a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. So that's why I have to be very careful about not only the morphology of the tachycardia, but how much pre-excitation you see at baseline and so forth. Interesting. So I, I, a, a long way of saying it's case by case. Case by case. Well, um, perfect. Uh, so we had a question here in the group. Um, if you could maybe allude to more on... Um, Adenosine and amiodarone? So amiodarone will have action in all four of Vaughn Williams classes. It'll, it'll uh, stabilize membranes and reduce the likelihood that uh, extra signals are propagated. Uh, and again, it has all four classes of activity. Um, and uh, It's important to note, however, that uh, even though it has all four classes of activity, it's not going to slow down heart rates very much. So it's not going to slow down heart rates as much as a as a um, class two or a class four agent would. Although inexorable bradycardia is a known consequence of giving amiodarone, although it's relatively infrequent, you're going to see mostly uh, potassium and to some extent a sodium channel uh, blocking activities. And amiodarone is used commonly for um, acute management of unstable ventricular arrhythmias, whether it's VF or even ventricular tachycardia. And amiodarone is also sometimes used for the treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation as well. And that's very distinct from uh, adenosine. Uh, you should think of adenosine as being a medication that effectively produces a profound parasympathetic or vagal effect. And so what it'll do is it'll uh, prevent uh, 
transmission through the AV node, and it's used often to terminate AV node reentrant tachycardia because basically it'll just break that circuit and lead, lead to a pause in spontaneous firing from the AV node and the, and the SA node, um, both terminating that circuit and giving the underlying heart rate a chance to step in again. As far as, um, you know, the pause as a result, how long, I guess, what's the half-life of adenosine in the system? Does it flush out very quick? Or? It's, uh, it's on the order of seconds. Okay. To the point where you need to administer it very swiftly uh, through an IV. Meaning you can't just, you can't just let it drip in. You need to flush it mm -hmm. and have a saline flush so that the bolus goes from the peripheral vein right to the heart immediately because it gets degraded very quickly in the bloodstream. So for our friends taking the CCDS, one of the things they will uh, comment about is effects of medication on DFTs and thresholds. Can you go in a little more detail? I know, for example, amiodarone will lower DFTs at least to some degree. Uh, DFTs being defibrillation thresholds for everyone. Yeah, I think that's a topic of a whole other talk, but generally speaking, I would say uh, amiodarone will increase the DFTs, whereas some class three agents can potentially decrease DFTs. Meaning by increasing DFTs, you make it harder for the defibrillator to shock the heart out of an arrhythmia. So if you give amiodarone, you may need to adjust how your device is programmed, meaning to give a higher joule shock in order to successfully terminate an arrhythmia, whereas uh, it's sometimes the case with class three agents like, you know, sodawol. Uh, or defedalide, it'll reduce that threshold such that the device may become incrementally more effective. Now, is that a reason to reprogram the device to give lower uh, joules? I haven't seen people doing that, but it just makes you not feel uh, nervous the way amiodarone would about the potential effectiveness of the defibrillator. Thanks for clarifying on that. Do we have any more questions from the group? Well, look, this is just one of many. Uh, you know, we'll have plenty of opportunities. And again, I think the concepts that we brought up today, these are things that are going to come up again and again uh, in future sessions. So as much as anything else, um, my comments today were really just the beginnings of an ongoing conversation on these topics. And I provided references um, within these slides so that you can go back to um, the, the papers uh, where these things were originally reported. Perfect. If you don't mind, uh, maybe forwarding the slides on to the larger group so everyone has it, and they'll have your references as well. And then and we'll you'll have the uh, recording. Yes. Yeah. And the recording will be posted on YouTube and I'll post that to the group as well. So, Oh, uh, looks like we have another question. Uh, Dr. Bradley wanted to thank you for your comprehensive talk. And then Elvis had a question. So they concerned about defib patients on amio. So sorry. I opened you mean that patients before. with defibrillators on amiodarone? It looks like it. Yeah. Correct. Uh, I'd say generally speaking, this is a very common combination. Right, because you know a person who needed a defibrillator is at high risk of uh, a dangerous arrhythmia, and it's often the case that um, it's not just enough to give the person a defibrillator, which will effectively function as an insurance policy. It's also the case that we need to do our best to treat with medication so as to minimize the likelihood that the patient needs that rescue shock. Right, and it's often the case that medications like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers are not enough, or it could be that, uh, you know, other agents like class one or class three agents are either ineffective or maybe even inappropriate in some patients, in which case, you know, you're left with amiodarone, which ends up being a drug used often for the sickest of patients because it's, it's neutral with respect to blood pressure, right? It does not lead to negative antitrust, uh, well, it's not a negative inotrope, right? The way beta blockers, calcium channels, would, uh, channel blockers would be. So that if you have an acutely ill patient in whom you think they're too sick for beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, 
or if they're bradycardic at baseline and you're worried about making the bradycardia worse, you can give amiodarone more safely in those circumstances. And yes, you're right. Um, in those circumstances, you worry about the possibility that the defibrillator may be ineffective. Um, your action in those circumstances is going to be variable, meaning uh, you may decide that uh, for a patient with a defibrillator who's receiving amiodarone, that you make sure that they are not dependent on uh, low joule shocks. You may choose to just give them maximum energy across all zones and across all modes for tachytherapies to make sure that you're giving them everything that the device has. And you may decide based on the circumstance that doing an actual induction of a, of a ventricular arrhythmia with true formal DFT testing is indicated. These days, people are doing DFT testing um, less and less. I think that the overall success of, you know, population-wide, the overall success of therapies delivered by uh, defibrillators is so high that people, at least uh, where I work, are, are no longer performing routine DFTs and will often perform DFTs primarily in those circumstances where we're seeing evidence that um, the device is failing to shock in specific circumstances. But the decision of how, how and when to proceed with DFTs uh, DFT testing for patients who are on amiodarone. Again, like we talked about for um, WPW, it's going to be case by case. Perfect. I think um, just to tack onto that, I think that also becomes a consideration of what device to use as well. So I know that sometimes you get a lot of uh, 36 joule devices um, maximum output. And if you have a patient where you already have a feeling they're going to have a higher DFT, um, you know, you could take in other factors like BMI and things like that as well. Um, you may want to consider going with the heavier duty can that has a full 40 joule output. Perfect. Anyone else have any, uh, any questions for us here for Dr. Potasic? Awesome. Well, I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tezik. That was an amazing lecture. And I know I'm going to uh, review it after we post it online just to, to go back over everything you went, because I think it really got into some of the core concepts that we need to build upon um, to make sure we, we have a good grasp of everything. So I appreciate your time this uh, afternoon, your time and everyone's uh, evening as well. And uh, thank you for joining us for our for our week one class. And we'll get uh, we'll get going from here. Looks like Jared may have a question. Oh, no, sorry. That was an accident. Just want to no. say a great talk and thanks for your time. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Looking Thank forward you. to the next. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you.